Charlie Parkinson, and I have always been best friends. Since summer vacation when we were little, we could always be found with our pants rolled up, standing barefoot in the red Missouri clay. He lived on a neighboring farm. Wherever I went, he always followed me. I'm used to him following me everywhere. We ended up becoming best friends. Even as teenagers, we could be seen working side by side for our fathers at the local farmer's market twice a week. For all the locals like us, we have formed a good reputation. Our approach to life was like night and day. We were complete opposites. Growing up in the countryside ingrained in me principles that still guide me in my adult life. Charlie wasn't like that. He was like a sail flapping in the wind, with no plans or direction other than to do what he liked or loved at the moment. His likes or dislikes changed every day depending on what he saw or heard. Every weekend we would help one of our moms cook and prepare special Sunday dinners. Sunday was set aside for family time. Apart from feeding the animals, everything else could wait. My parents raised me in a house where there were no men's or women's jobs. If someone needed help, someone else pitched in. Each of them supported us while we worked in the kitchen or in the fields. Our questions always got them thinking about how they could expand the way they did things. Looking back, it was me who asked them questions. As a result, I discovered a real interest in cooking at a young age. Charlie, to be a little different, took up baking. Charlie discovered that he liked baking, and at age 13 he was hired as a weekend worker at a local bakery. The brighter the decorations on his creations, the more he liked it. I was hired at a local restaurant and began to climb the corporate ladder. With them I was used to doing whatever was needed, when needed. All my free time I was glued to a TV channel about food. It was a gift for me. I watched and learned, seeing so many pushing the boundaries of what was possible. It became a family tradition that every time our parents got tojther while eating at lunch, each of us had to create our own dish. The only restriction was that it had to complement the dinner. Neither of us considered it an obligation. It was fun for both of us. It didn't take long before we learned that your harshest critics can be your own parents. By the time we reached high school, it was well known what our lifelong career paths would be. Charles and I both went to our respective culinary schools after 10th grade and did well. It was a big struggle with my parents. They thought I should finish grade 12, but I persisted until they finally gave up. In our 20s, we both worked our way up in the restaurant industry, gaining the necessary experience at a young age. As a result, life took us in different directions. By chance, we both returned home at the same time. We were catching up. The first time we saw Tracy was at the local fall fair, when we once again returned home to help our families in pursuit of best of awards. We both said the same thing about her without meeting her at all. The way she looked, walked, and carried herself spoke for itself. The lady knew that she was attractive and was not afraid to use her advantages to her advantage. We called her the man-killer because at the time she, in our opinion, was being hard on her date because of something she thought he did. We joked that if the man-killer ever gets married, it will be to a coward, because we have the impression that she should always be in control of the situation. We laughed because we felt that with this attitude men had no chance. The man would have been better off crawling into a hole and dying. The profanity that came out of her mouth out of anger was very revealing. If we could describe it, we would probably say it was blue lightning. An hour later, the giant Ferris wheel broke down. The volunteer fire brigade was called. There were two very frightened little girls stuck at the very top. Charlie and I soon started or climbed up, each carrying a rope to lower the stuck people down. We started lowering them when the firefighters arrived. It took us about an hour with our joint efforts, but we did it. Two little girls have been reunited with their mother. Immediately afterwards, we headed to the Legion's beer stand to reward ourselves with a cold beer. We had just finished our first beer and were trying to decide if we would make it in time for the second when the man-killer appeared, placing another one in front of us. This is my way of saying thank you for saving my cousin's children from a terrible situation. 
My name is Tracy Barton, said the man killer, extending her hand. This is my best friend Charlie Patterson, and I'm Riley Pearson. Nice to meet you and thanks for the beer, but it really wasn't necessary, I said. Are you local? she asked. This led to us explaining that we had just returned home to attend the fair and catch up because we both had professional jobs working in upscale restaurants in the city. We found out that she studied at the university and came to visit. I happened to mention that I saw her with her boyfriend. She laughed and said that she would never date such an idiot. It was her cousin. My criticism of him was long overdue. About two weeks after the dinner ended, one of the waiters approached me. Riley, there is a mother and daughter who want to thank the chef personally, and since you are the highest-ranking junior chef, it should be you. With nothing else to do, I took the time to head out, taking a couple of free special desserts with me. It was Tracy and her mother. We talked for a bit, and I didn't think anything of it. At the end of my shift, I found her waiting for me. This is how our relationship began. Before we knew it, I thought we were dating. I have to admit that this was never confirmed, but was assumed due to how much time we spent together. It was the same with Charlie and her, but unfortunately neither of us knew it. She played with both of us, but God, the sex was good. She knew how to wear us down, always leaving us sophisticated, but wanting to come back for more. The morning sex and subsequent departure from her dorm was tricky. She was still a man killer because, at least for me, after she was done with me, all I wanted to do was roll over and go to sleep. But we were young and stupid. Everything was going well until we were all caught up in an unexpected situation. Charlie and I argued when he heard rumors that she might be pregnant. This caused a lot of friction between us that day because he came in bragging to me that he was going to be a father. When I asked who the lucky mother was, he said Tracy Barton. It hit me like a bolt from the blue. My heart broke, but I hid my feelings well. I swore to myself that Charlie would never find out that she was dating both of us. It was obvious that he didn't know about it. I thought about it all day until I found the answer I thought I needed. Because I wasn't ready to settle in yet, and Charlie insisted that he was, I decided to back off without telling him. I convinced myself that she actually loved him more based on what he told me. I handed in my resignation believing that the man-killer would say yes to my best friend. I knew I had to leave. One way or another, I knew that our long friendship was finally over because of the man-killer. I couldn't fully accept what was about to happen. It will be a long time before I remember what Charlie was like as a person. Six years later, I noticed the man-killer as soon as she walked in that Friday afternoon with one of the shareholders of our restaurant. It was morning even before opening. I knew something was going on because we never allowed visitors at that time of day due to the commotion. At this time of day, the restaurant seemed to be in complete disarray. Set up dishes for easy access for the prep line, chopping vegetables, preparing salads and slicing meats for the day. She didn't seem to recognize me as I worked in the busy pre-opening kitchen with my staff. We were preparing for a large influx of visitors, which we had been expecting since lunch until the end of the evening. Perhaps it was the full beard I had grown, or the fact that I had grown a few inches. I was now six feet three inches tall with a 36-inch waist, but my height made me look thin. This is because I was burning what I ate by cooking for up to 14 hours a day. Most of my staff considered me a workaholic who had no personal life at all. Most people who have never seen the inside of a restaurant kitchen have no idea how much prep work is required beforehand. The beginning of the day was the stage where we prepared everything we needed to start the work day. Today's special was salmon steak, brown rice, baby asparagus with lemon tartar sauce, which required a special side dish. I was grateful for this. Being organized and prepared was a requirement. This gave us time to set up my kitchen each day for a smooth flow of work. My staff thought I was a little boring about it, but it was my way and it worked. This kept our lunch service time short and efficient. We could offer fast service to the office crowd. Over the past three years, my approach has grown the restaurant's reputation throughout our state. 
The man killer was the last person I wanted in my life again. I saw her use her charms once. For me, it was once too much. It was a day that I kept reliving in my thoughts. I still woke up from nightmares because of it. The professionals I consulted said I was suffering from a version of PTSD due to the extreme violence I witnessed. They thought that I would finally be able to overcome this once the true understanding of the whole situation came to light. She walked in, as always, acting like she owned the place, looking just as amazing as she did then. Even though she was dressed modestly to hide her natural curves, it didn't work. No matter what she wore, she always looked damn hot. Even now, when she tried to look more conservative and businesslike in a dress, her body shape did not allow it. She always was so attractive, and she knew it. Five foot eight inches tall, with a size six breast and a waist as narrow as most other women's, her every move automatically accentuated her curves. The softness and warmth of her body openly attracted all normal men. Any man would happily become her if she wanted it. Having natural brown hair, emerald eyes, and a smile that could melt the coldest heart only enhanced her image. She had class, style, and grace that made any man she was with stand out from the crowd. Even childbirth did not change her or reduce her sexuality in any way. Anytime, anywhere, or anywhere, most men will trip over her until she has a wedding ring. Although almost six years had passed, it seemed that time had changed nothing about the man-killer. Men were still drawn to her like bees to the sweet nectar of a flower. I knew the power she held in her hands. With this power she was lethal. In my eyes, Tracy was still as beautiful as she was then. Proof of this could be seen in the reaction of my male staff. More than one went wide-eyed while others hid behind counters to hide their excitement. I knew that tonight she would be the one to fill their dreams. My female staff's eyes were full of envy because she was what they wanted to be. Many men have licked their lips at her, but only a few have ever enjoyed her charms. I know because I was once one of them. On her side was the man I assumed was her current husband, an older man who proudly displayed her as his prized trophy. She was followed by a very small mini version of her who walked and acted the same way. Our co-owner, shareholder, announced unexpected news. The gentleman with her bought out all the company's shareholders, except one. This gave him control rights to the building and business. Both were built from scratch when we started the company. The deal had already been completed, and he was going to take over at the end of the month. He was going to franchise the entire restaurant business that I helped build, growing it into a national chain over the next five years. This was to be his flagship restaurant, a place to meet potential clients where he could show them around firsthand. Everyone was shocked. I was not. I've seen rodeos like this before. Some worked out in the long term, but many didn't. It all depended on the person behind it. Was he a long-time player? or was he just in it to make a quick buck? Planning to stay just long enough to get the most out of it before it starts to fall apart due to its lack of structure. The Hooters chain, which no longer existed, was a good example. It was the special dishes I created that made this restaurant one of the top five in the state. I didn't worry about that shit. I had enough savings to start my own if I wanted to. I didn't need this place. This place needed me. It would be easy to find another job when they heard I left. I wouldn't even have to look. They will come to me. Looking at her made that day flash before me much more strongly than before. I used to be able to hide it when it happened, but this time I couldn't. I knew I had to make a decision whether it was good or bad. At that moment I decided. I took off my full white apron and took it off. My loyal staff were in a state of disbelief because in front of them I could not do what I was doing. But I did. I just said, oh well, in my thoughts. The kitchen is yours now, I told my deputy before heading to the staff locker room. I headed to the locker room, planning to clean out my locker one last time. The person who made the announcement was running after me, shouting, hey, wait, the sale will only take place if you agree to stay. Was it the new owner's idea or his wife's, I asked. She's not his wife, but does that matter, he asked. 
I said no because I really don't care. Just tell the man killer, I replied, that out of respect for the departed Charlie, I think it's best for everyone if I just leave, as I began to clean out my closet. Let them know they can buy my shares. In a panic, he ran out to convey my words. You see, Lee, Charlie was my brother in every way except blood. He died several years ago from a bullet. He left this way because the lady who just came back into my life refused to accept his marriage proposal. How do I know this? I was there with the cops trying to convince him not to do it. She may have forgotten, but I haven't, because I still live with the memory of it every day. Watching your dear friend kill himself is something you will never forget. To this day I wonder if she gave him the gun. I heard the sound of heels on the tile floor, which became louder as she approached me. I haven't talked to that bitch since Charlie died, and I really didn't want to. The sound of those heels warned me. Seeing her again was a living reminder of what I was still trying to leave behind. I decided to be cold and distant, keeping our communication very short and not letting my emotions show. The less time I spend with the man-killer, the better for the safety of my own sanity. In part, I was afraid of her. I had good reasons for this. If she could get Charlie to do what he did to himself, I often wondered what she could push me to do in the name of love. This kind of power over another scared me. Riley, stop. Almost six years have passed. We need to talk about what happened then, at least to find out the whole truth. The fact that you run to avoid me because you can't face what happened won't help either of us solve this. The man killer said as she walked in and held my apron. Together we must find a way to move past Charlie's death. Behind for the greater good. If one of us wants to be free enough to move forward in life. I can't. I witnessed his death that night after you broke up with him. He was so eager to take responsibility for his daughter. You refused him. He couldn't handle the pain, I replied. You know it, just like I. As a result, we have nothing to talk about. So why start now? At this time, a mini version was included. At that moment, I noticed her hazel eyes. All of Charlie's relatives on both sides had brown eyes. She wasn't Charlie's daughter like I thought. Oh damn, I instantly thought there must be a third man she was dating at the time. This proved that she was a better player than Charlie and me. We were just a couple of horny young fools. I wondered who he was and what he knew. Then the man-killer introduced her to me. This is my daughter, whom I named after her father Riley. Here is Mr. Pearson, the head cook I told you about, said the man-killer. Now you understand why it's important that we talk. Honey, can you go back to Grandpa? I need to talk to Mr. Pearson alone. Her words struck me like a bolt from the blue. I was stunned because I immediately realized that everything I had believed for so long was wrong. What I've been through in the last five years because of what I thought I did was self-inflicted. I was so angry about what happened that I left instead of trying to find out the truth. Damn, I told myself. One thing could be said about the man-killer. She never lied no matter how much trouble she found herself in. She had a character that made her accept the consequences of her actions and acknowledge them. Now I understand why the man-killer refused to marry him. Her character would not allow her to burden a man with someone else's child. I knew Riley was mine. The past began to make sense. I felt it getting hard for me. I just sat down and covered my face with my hands, collecting my thoughts. I spoke in a broken voice. Did Charlie know the truth? I asked because I needed to know. Yes, I told him earlier that day when he died. He knew you were the father. I wanted to tell you first. Charlie found out the hard way why I couldn't marry him. He just couldn't accept a simple answer. He should have known the whole story. I didn't even know that I also dated each of you, said the man killer. I knew, like you that he always had problems accepting the real truth, even when he was presented with the facts. Today he would be called a snowflake, a superficial person without depth, a perfect example of a social misfit because he always needed someone to tell him what to do or what to think. It's hard for me to understand how you two could become lifelong friends. You were so different, 
Tracy said. He convinced himself that the baby I was carrying was his and made all the plans about how everything would be before talking to me. I still don't know how he found out because I told very few people. I found out a few weeks later that after he left me that day, he bought and used illegal substances all day. He was trying to kill his emotional pain. The police believe that one of the dealers sold him the gun because it was serial. The number has been erased. My thoughts went back to our growing years. I don't think the man-killer realized how accurate her comment was. Charlie was a follower who had no idea what he wanted to do in life. If I wasn't his best friend, I can't imagine what his life would be like. He was spoiled as a child, while I had to fight and achieve what I wanted. I developed a discipline, a focus based on the boundaries that were set for me as a child. They could only be pushed to a certain limit. If you go too far, you pay the price. We had to learn to think before we act. Charlie was raised to be a free spirit, and wherever the crowd moved, he seemed to flow in that direction. For some reason, I could never understand why he spent his entire life trying to imitate me. That explains a lot, I said quietly, standing up. Here I was, blaming you for his death when it's now clear that I'm just as guilty as you are. I apologize to you for that. We were both madly in love with you. If you had said boo, we'd both have jumped. He told me that he was going to propose. I told him that if you accepted it, I would not be an obstacle to your relationship. I would leave to give us all time to accept our new reality. I truly believed that you loved him more. So I gave my resignation. I was going to quit at the end of the day. The police called me that night because they thought I could talk him out of the pain and grief he was facing. He was so drunk at the time that nothing he said made sense, he continued quietly, I... It's clear now that everything I did while I was there only pushed him further towards the edge. I saw him pull the trigger to end his life. Since I quit right after the funeral, I left, trying to leave it's all over. Now I admit that my behavior was wrong. I should have stayed and discussed everything. Put your apron back on. Your leaving won't solve anything, said the not-so-man killer. We can start building our new relationship later. We need to find a way to leave Charlie in the past first, Tracy explained. Looking me straight in the eyes, Tracy continued, For the record, I wasn't looking for you. My dad decided to buy this to build a new network. He got bored when he retired from the game, leaving management of our current networks to me. I came with him. This morning to meet the chef who inspired his bold new plan to discover that it is you. I knew the moment I saw you that you would try to run away because of the guilt you still carry. You have to let it go. It was no one's fault, Tracy said seriously. Charlie has been Charlie's problem since childhood because he had no real foundation to build on. His parents were hippies who believed in free love. As for Charlie, let's be honest about that. I'm just as guilty, like you, because I loved two men for different reasons and was so immature that I couldn't choose which one of you I wanted to marry, and I ended up losing both of them. So, are you married? No, I'm not married, and I haven't dated anyone since then. You could say I'm not in love at all, I explained. My past, because of what happened, killed my desire. You could say that that was the day when I love died. Me too. I'm back home with a mom and dad who adore their five-year-old granddaughter. It's been a long, lonely six years, she said, taking my hand in friendship. For the sake of our daughter, we must put Charlie's past behind us. Does your father know our history? I asked the former man-killer when she let go of my hand. He knows what happened, but he has no idea that it was you. He has never forgiven me for my behavior during that period. After all, I was raised to be a decent girl. Between you two and me, we ruined it all, said Tracy. We have to start building a relationship for our daughter's sake, don't we? That's if you want to be in her life. I admitted that she was right. Moreover, I was also a man-killer. I finally understood why I couldn't bring my friend back from the edge he was on. I extended my hand to her. She took it. We walked out together, holding hands. I couldn't help but notice the smile on her face. 
I was still holding my apron in my other hand when we returned to the kitchen. I saw great relief on her worried father's brow. Tracy and I talked for a long time. He probably thought his plans were falling apart. If Tracy hadn't collided with me, they would have collapsed. Little Riley looked at us carefully. She seemed as surprised as everyone else that we were holding hands. My entire staff looked absolutely stunned because once I made a decision, no one ever saw me change it, and so I returned with an apron in my hand. Many questions will need to be answered in the coming days. Riley, are you staying? Someone had to ask. My little five-year-old daughter widened her eyes in surprise and ran towards me. Her grandfather's face expressed complete surprise. I automatically knelt down to be at her level, with her mother standing next to me. Like my father, I wanted to be on her level to answer the question I expected her to ask. I wanted little Riley to be able to look me straight in the eye. Are you my dad? Riley asked, looking into my eyes. Yes, I just found out about it, I replied. I'd like to get to know you better, if that's what you want. Little Riley looked at her mother for confirmation. Tracy nodded her head in approval. Riley then wrapped her arms around my neck. I picked her up, standing up. Tracy's whole face spoke volumes. I knew it was something she was hoping for, but in her mind would never see. It was clear that she saw the tears accumulating in my eyes. She knew that I took her words as truth. Enough standing around, I growled. Get back to work. Tim, you're in charge. I'm off for the rest of the day. The kitchen staff returned to work, but continued to look at me in confusion. I knew I would have to answer a lot of questions in the coming days. I handed my apron to one of the staff to throw it in the wash. My little daughter seemed weightless in my arms. Riley, her grandfather said, trying to make sense of it all. How about you come with me and we'll let your parents talk? I promise you'll see them both tomorrow morning. Riley shook her head in denial. She wasn't going to let me go so easily. I took the keys out of my pocket, handing them to Tracy. You'll have to drive, because I don't think this little angel is ready to let me go, I said. A smile appeared on Tracy's face. Are you still driving that truck with the stupid Confederate license plates fully loaded? She asked. Yes, it is. It's parked behind the staff door, one of the food preparation workers replied. How do you know? No matter how old a man is, he should always have something that reminds him of his roots. For Riley, that's always been the case, Tracy said. Come on, show me the way. I hope you can drive a manual, I said, knowing she could. I spent many nights in Missouri on red clay teaching her to drive. She turned her face towards me and stuck out her tongue. I laughed. Because you were a horse ass all these years. I'm about to have a little tire run while I'm leaving. Even in these heels, she replied with that laugh I've always liked. You're responsible for keeping our daughter safe. Dad, tell the office that I won't be coming today. She actually drove about half a block, causing little Riley to open her eyes wide in surprise because her mom wasn't acting like a mom. I laughed because I could always get her to let out her wild side. I directed her to my house on the outskirts of the city. Which house? Tracy asked as we pulled into the driveway. To the new one. I haven't had time to demolish the old one yet, I answered. I moved into a new one six months ago. As soon as she unlocked the door, I turned on the light. The kitchen instantly lit up. All the appliances were high-end stainless steel, built into a European-style kitchen with a wide, half-drop ceiling and an island that could seat four. There was a corner nearby. The entire house was one level with an unfinished basement below. Apart from the master bedroom, there was almost no furniture in the house. I took her through the four bedrooms, the lowered hall, the living room, and the dining room. As soon as Riley saw my two cats, she started chasing them. This gave Tracy and I a chance to catch up. While Riley said she was hungry, I asked if she liked French toast and sausage. She said yes, so I started getting ready to make us all some. Riley asked if she could help. Her mother was about to say something when she saw my gaze. Within seconds I had Riley on one of the chairs, 
She was on her knees holding a fork. I placed a stainless bowl in front of her. After breaking six eggs, I added a little cream. Using a measuring spoon, I let her taste the vanilla before adding it. Then came the rest of the spices. I let her smell each one. I showed her how to whisk to get everything well mixed, holding my hand over hers. She knelt next to me while I held her chair next to me. She really enjoyed dipping the bread into the egg mixture as needed. Question questions she asked made me very happy. I tried to explain everything to her as simply as possible. Tracy watched us grow closer. She was surprised at how naturally we accepted each other. I noticed she looked a little alarmed as I pulled Riley's chair up to the stove. But she didn't say anything. As I turned on the gas burner, I explained that we were cooking over real fire, so we needed to be very careful. She asked why. I replied that a bad burn can cause permanent damage and leave scars. Rolling up my sleeves, I showed my daughter the scars I had from numerous burns. Riley sat between us as we ate. She tasted each syrup, asking how they were different from each other. I laughed. Even her mother seemed surprised by how much she ate. You surprised me, Tracy said. You took her interest in what you do and let her become completely immersed in it. She'll talk about it for days. My father was busy on the farm, but he always made sure that whatever time he could give us was quality time, I said. When you let me spend time with her, time with her will be the same. We decided to spend the day at the zoo together. Little Riley loved riding in the big truck. Her mother and I talked about the good times we had together. We both found joy in watching our daughter's delight at seeing all the animals. It was almost five in the evening when Tracy received a call asking if I would join her family for dinner. Tracy convinced me, although it took me a few minutes to agree, as long as I could get home and freshen up first. Tracy's father came home right after we left to tell his wife what he had just learned. This was when he first learned the whole story. He was shocked to learn that neither of us knew about the other. It only took me a few minutes to take a quick shower and shave my beard. I put on a black shirt, black trousers, and leather shoes without laces. Before picking up the gray jacket, I applied a little musk. He walked out of the bedroom, ready to go. I knew that for a future relationship with her parents, I needed to make a good impression. I could no longer act like a simple country boy. After all, now I was a father. I needed to start acting like it. Tracy looked at me and said, Wow. I laughed. You look great for a country guy, she said with a smile. That's the only reason you're taking me dancing tonight. Good luck. I have another 14-hour work day tomorrow. So, if we go, it won't be for long, I replied. Besides, with the way you look right now, I didn't want your parents to think you were hanging out with slackers again. This cost me a playful tap on the shoulder. She saw me place the truck keys on the key holder by the door. Then I took the next set of keys. Walking through the garage, she saw my Jaguar. She laughed. My father will be waiting for your big truck. How often do you drive it? On those rare days when I don't work, I replied as we got into the car. Little Riley quickly fell asleep as we drove to Tracy's house. When we arrived, I carried her inside in my arms. Tracy's mother recognized me immediately, remembering the meeting in the old restaurant. She offered me a cocktail, which I declined. Then she suggested something more masculine, but I again refused, saying that I would wait until we had wine for dinner. Dinner started with French onion soup. Tracy and I each tried one spoonful and both pushed our plates to the side. One of the guests was offended. I'm famous for my soup, he said as if he were someone important. Onions imported from France. The base is made of crystals. The onions are rehydrated in it. As a result, the main taste is salt. It's so powerful that you can't taste the onions or the beef. This cost about $3.25 a bowl, I replied. Did I understand correctly? It was clear from his face that I had guessed right. I looked at Tracy. She asked how long it would take. I replied, 10 minutes, if the kitchen has the ingredients. She said, come on. 
and I went to do it. The chef brought me two large white onions, and in less than a minute I had them peeled and chopped. I grabbed a cast iron skillet and added enough oil to fry two-thirds of the onion until golden brown. I pureed the remaining third in a blender until liquid. I then poured store-bought beef broth into a large pot to heat it up. I turned on the oven broiler and put eight slices of white bread in there to crisp them up. Tracy began to grate the mozzarella cheese. While checking the bread, I turned it over to brown the other side, stirring the onion all the time. Once the bread was browned on both sides, I took the pan out. Tracy poured in fresh cheese and put it back in the oven to melt the cheese. I spooned the golden brown onions and the oil into the broth and tasted them. Added some garlic salt, a couple of herbs, and some liquid onion. Tried it again to make sure everything was perfect. When the soup began to boil, it was ready. Once the cheese was melted, I trimmed the bread to fit the bowl. We added soup and topped it with cheese-covered bread. By the time we took it to the table, it was perfect. The bread absorbed all the flavor. The remaining oil gave it a natural look. Everyone really liked it. You could taste both the onion and the beef broth in each bite. Nothing interrupted each other. In season, each serving costs about 75 cents. Out of season, it costs $1.25. This serving is twice that size and could be sold as a snack for $4.99 a bowl, I said. Peter, said Tracy's mother, let me introduce you to my daughter's boyfriend, Chef Pearson, the only other shareholder in my husband's new restaurant. Now you understand why David wanted him. The restaurant specials are his creations. Peter's face turned pale. I've heard of your reputation. I have to admit, this is the fastest cooking I've ever seen. You've proven your point. No wonder the restaurant is doing so well. If you wanted to reduce the cost of beef broth, you could do it by contracting with a local supplier who has access to grains. NY Meat Processing Enterprises. By buying bones cheaply, we could make our own broth and store it, already opened, in five-gallon containers. This way we could control the quality of the product. I didn't even notice how intently Tracy's father, David, was listening to me. I did what I did to show that good things don't have to be expensive. Tracy said, Enough business talk. Gentlemen, let's eat. This soup is too good to go cold. At that moment, little Riley was standing next to me. I picked her up, and we shared my soup. This was the first time she tried it. She started asking questions. Everyone watched as I explained the basics in a way she could understand. Her grandfather offered her a chair, but she refused, saying, No, I'm with Dad. I want to stay here. I couldn't help but notice how tears welled up in Tracy's mother's eyes. Little Riley shared everything with me and others. For such a little girl, she really talked a lot. Her grandmother learned my correct way to make French toast and what ingredients go into it. Like all children, she was a little careless, which didn't make it any easier since I was playing with her while we ate. Tracy commented that she found it funny how I could interact with our child like a child. You teach her, but she has no idea, she noted. I finally got out a wet wipe to clean the residue off both of us. By the time we finished eating, it was time for Riley to go to bed. When Tracy took her to get ready for bed, it gave her mother and I a chance to talk. She hasn't dated anyone since everything broke, Katie Barton said. She blamed herself for letting things go too far with both of you. She wasn't the only one who felt that way, I replied. I thought that she loved Charlie more than me and that the child was his. If today had not happened, I would never have known the truth. So you weren't running away from responsibility, she said in surprise. You didn't even know you were a father. No, I didn't know. It was seeing him pull the trigger and my resentment of her for it that made things the way they are. Were, I said softly. I realized that all these things as I knew them didn't add up. It made me look at everything differently. This happened just before Tracy introduced her, saying that she named her after her father. It made me confront the kind of person Charlie really was in his life. I was able to put it all together in the end thanks to Riley and her.
Now I have begun to forget the past. You both are doing this. Take small steps. Don't rush because of your sense of responsibility, Katie said wisely. Tracy never believed this would happen. She's so happy today that she's floating on clouds. It's been an unexpected blessing for both of you. Don't give up on it. Take time to see if things can work out ahead. You both have a second chance. Look to the future, leaving the past behind. It should be like this. That's when Tracy showed up saying we had a problem. Both Katie and I asked what was wrong. Riley wants her dad to read her a bedtime story. I laughed and said that I would go. She chose her favorite story. Old MacDonald had a farm. I lay down next to her on her bed while Tracy left us alone. As I began to read, Tracy called her mother to listen in the hallway. Growing up on a farm, I was good at imitating animal sounds. I included these sounds when reading a fairy tale. Riley tried to repeat them when I made them. We both ended up laughing a lot. When I finished, she asked me to read it again. I agreed, but said that this time I would not make any noise because I had to calm her down before going to bed. I stayed with her until she fell asleep. Returning to the main living room, I found both Katie and Tracy smiling. Father David asked me what I would like to drink. I said a good cup of coffee would be just fine. Cream and sugar, he asked. I answered yes, with a sip of whiskey. He smiled and went to get a drink. I love the way you read stories, Katie said with a laugh. My granddaughter seems to be excited too. Well, Tracy knows how important time with Riley is to me, I replied. It looks like I have plenty of time to catch up. Not just with her, Tracy said, taking my hand. We're in a new relationship, and it starts with us exchanging phone numbers. By the time her father returned with my rather large coffee, we were already done. We all went into the living room to chat. Tracy's parents took their favorite chairs, leaving us the sofa. I felt that Tracy sat a little too close to me. Riley, can you turn this French onion soup recipe into a standard that every establishment can follow? Asked David. It's easy if we keep the portion sizes the same. Why? I asked. Most of our restaurants are considered middle-class establishments, he explained. This would be an ideal snack to introduce to them as it complements a lot of what we offer. If we did what you suggested in producing our own beef and chicken base, we could also introduce this to the retail market. It's doable. The key is to find the right contacts and keep your overall costs down, I replied. The same base can be used for many things. For example, the last Sunday of every month is wanton day. I make wantons out of nothing and offer wanton soup or stewed wantons on white rice until they sell out using beef broth. It's huge. Success for our takeaway sales that day. We set a new record every month. Tracy walked me to the door. It was almost 11. I needed to go home to get some sleep. She leaned over and kissed me on the cheek. Thank you for turning a disaster into a day I'll never forget. And neither will our daughter, Tracy said before wishing me good night. I later found out that she was watching me from the window while I was driving away. On Saturday morning, everything went as usual. All my co-workers questioned me about my experience with the damn woman and our history. Everyone made fun of how I could let such a girl leave. I didn't give any details and enjoyed their teasing. Several colleagues suggested that she reminded them of the red-haired cartoon character from the movie that framed Roger Rabbit. I laughed about this all day. To get them off the topic, I told them we needed to come up with a new name for the restaurant because the current one was too long to be used online. This got them thinking. We have always had a quiet period between influxes of visitors, and this time it came a little earlier. This gave us the opportunity to replenish supplies and prepare for the next influx. One of the waitresses came in and said there was a little girl at the door with her mom who wanted to know if her dad could join them for lunch before she ordered. I asked her who he was. Smiling, I told her that I would be out soon. I started taking off my apron to hang it up. Tracy was dressed more simply, but still looked amazing. She wore a white tank top and tight blue jeans, and dressed our daughter the same way. 
I will never forget the way her eyes sparkled and the way she smiled when I approached their table. As soon as I sat down, she climbed down from her seat to sit on my lap. Tracy just shook her head. I told her she'd get over it. I'm new to her now. Tracy said she didn't think that was the case because she was also a daddy's girl growing up. The waitress took our order. Riley didn't want to order anything, saying she would share it with me. When the order arrived, her eyes widened. I ordered a large double portion of French fries with gravy sauce. Riley decided this was her new favorite dish. Dad's talking about moving you to the corporate department, Tracy said. He was so impressed with you last night. I think he enjoyed the way you put Peter in his place. He thinks you are best suited to create new dishes for marketing and advertising. Your keen sense of price and quality sets you apart from others. Peter allowed his ability to feel important, I replied. I've seen many men fall because of these attitudes. Most chain restaurants fail because they forget about their core customer base, those who live paycheck to paycheck. Even here, keeping the selection and prices affordable for them is key. Families so they can come with more than three or four times a year. This weekend, thanks to you, he's in the office looking into the possibility of creating our own line of broth, just like you suggested. His problem is what part of the chicken to use, Tracy said. Send him a message and tell him we'll only use chicken feet with claws. A cold rinse and shake will clean them out. Ten minutes of boiling then slow simmering will give us more flavor and depth than anything else on the market as long as we don't dilute it too much. I answered. At that moment, one of our regular customers came up and said, Chief Pearson, I didn't know you had such a wonderful family. Tracy blushed when I thanked her for the compliment. I have a day off tomorrow and Monday. What are your plans? I asked. Nothing special, but I have to work on Monday. What are you up to? Asked Tracy. I'd like to take our daughter to meet her other grandparents, I explained. When you're ready for it. Maybe tomorrow is too soon? Tracy said with a huge smile. Let me call them and find out, I said. I backed my truck into their driveway this early Sunday morning as I picked them up for a two-hour drive. The first thing Tracy noticed was that it wasn't hanging on the back of my truck. Why did you take them off? She asked. I replied that they were not what I considered appropriate for children. Yes, Dad, she giggled with an air of pride. Seeing animals in real life for the first time is an unforgettable experience for most city children. As we pulled off the interstate, Riley became excited. First there were birds flying in flocks, then cattle in the pastures. Seeing a couple of horses grazing was another thrill. Then we pulled into the gravel driveway of my parents' house. Mom and Dad came out to meet us as we unloaded from the truck. My parents were accompanied by a pair of baby goats that were only a few days old. Riley couldn't contain her excitement. She just had to run after them while I introduced Tracy to them for the first time. She's a real spark, my dad Tracy said as we watched Riley and the kids interact. Within seconds, she already had two new friends. She couldn't contain her excitement, and neither could the little goats, who were starting to get a little restless. This scared Riley. Daddy, help, she screamed. I walked over and sat next to her, which calmed the kids down. I explained that her excitement made them worry the same way they usually react. One of the kids jumped onto my lap and sat down. Soon Riley was stroking them. I got up and went back to my parents. Dad, my father said with a questioning look. Son, you have a lot to confess, said my mother. I was grateful that my little sister ran out to me. This gave me a chance to introduce everyone. I called Riley over and she came over. Mom, Dad, and Janie. This is my girlfriend Tracy and our daughter Riley. Riley, this is your family on your father's side. These are your grandparents and aunt, I said. Janie, can you show Riley around the farm while we explain everything to Mom and Dad? We didn't hide anything. Tracy and I agreed that from now on we should discuss everything with complete honesty. No matter what age you are, it's always hard to admit that you've made a lot of mistakes. It took us about an hour and a half, 
but we explained everything. My father, being a man of principles, decided that he should reprimand me. As soon as he started, Tracy said, Don't. We're both tired of paying for our mistakes. Let your son and I sort out our problems. I was the problem, not him. He has forgiven me and is rebuilding his relationship with both of us because this is the kind of person you raised him to be. My father was dumbfounded as he was interrupted before he could begin. Eventually, he started laughing. She suits you, son, he said. Your mom would say the same thing and do it to my dad. The rest of the visit was spent getting to know their granddaughter. Mom took many photographs of the three of us using her mobile phone. Riley helped Mom and I prepare dinner for all of us. It reminded me of a time when I was young. Tracy learned a lot about me that day. Dad and Tracy began to build a relationship because she asked him a lot of questions, which he answered with pride. Honestly, the day went better than I expected. Before we left, my mother pulled me aside. She still loves you, but she's afraid to tell you, Mom said. I can see it in her eyes, so don't wait too long to sort out your feelings. We were expecting our first child before we got married, and we lost him. We went through hell because of this with our parents. That's why your father said what said earlier. The two-hour drive home was spent in silence. I had a lot to think about. I was grateful that both girls fell asleep. Both of our mothers gave me wise advice. I thought a lot, and by the time we returned to her parents' house, I had pretty much figured it out. After we put our daughter to bed, I asked Tracy to walk me to the truck. When we got there, I turned to her and hugged her for the first time in years. We've spent the last three days together as a family. How about you start working on us a little when you're ready, I said quietly. You are sure, she asked with tears in her eyes. I responded by tilting my head and giving her a long, long overdue kiss. Does this answer your question? I asked. She just put her head on my shoulder and cried. I held her until she calmed down. I should have waited until you decided for yourself. I knew that once you knew the truth, you would come back. Thank you. You confirmed my faith in us, Tracy said happily. Her parents watched us as we talked by the truck. They saw us kissing and me holding her while she cried. They're figuring it out faster than I thought, Katie said. He's an honest man. David, he didn't know the baby was his until she told him on Friday. Don't ruin their chance. I watched Tracy walk back into the house. Katie was waiting for her daughter when she returned to the house. They talked for a couple of hours. Tracy was finally able to confess her true feelings for Riley. Her mother listened without judging. She was secretly very hot eyes by his daughter and her belief that if they can just talk, then over time everything will work out. I woke up Monday morning completely surprised. For the first time in months, I didn't live through the night Charlie died. More importantly, I understood why. I felt calm inside. I knew the nightmares were gone forever. Tracy coming back into my life brought me the relief I had been chasing for five years. My father's words yesterday kept coming back to me. You struggle with a lot of what ifs and if onlys. When you least expect it, your soul will give you the answer. After breakfast, I called the local fire inspector and asked if he would be interested in conducting a controlled burn of an old house as a training event for his team. He was interested, so we worked out the details. I thought about this after receiving several offers to demolish an old house. After a controlled burn, cleanup could be completed in less than a day. This would save me thousands of dollars. I went into town and ordered two dozen roses to deliver to Tracy at her office, spacing the deliveries two hours apart. When she read both cards together, they read, Dinner for two tonight at my house, signed, Confederate Plates. I bought a nice oak table for the kitchen alcove that I could easily install in about an hour. Two bottles of good white wine along with ingredients for lamb kofta, Greek salad, Greek bread and cheesecake ingredients for dessert. The first dozen arrived at 11 in the morning. Secretary Tracy brought in yellow roses in an excited state. But I was upset when I saw that the message was incomplete. It caught her off guard when Tracy said he wasn't done yet. 
How do you know? Asked the secretary. Easy. Message incomplete. Damn, now I can't do anything until I get the rest, Tracy said out loud. Who is he? Tracy smiled and said, wait and see. The second batch arrived at 13. They were red. The secretary was more excited than Tracy. She ran in carrying them while Tracy was on the phone. Tracy told the caller that she would have to call back because something very important had happened. When Tracy opened the card, she began to cry. Seeing her reaction, the secretary said, This is a big deal. Tracy put both cards together and let her read the full message. Tracy grabbed her phone and texted, I'll be there at seven. Then she started crying. The secretary closed the door and consoled her. None of them worked as Tracy told her their whole story. Tracy called her mother when she calmed down to explain why she wasn't coming home. The only thing her mother said was, Remember baby steps. Tracy arrived on time. I poured us a glass of one of our favorite white wines. We talked about everyday things as I cut black olives, cucumbers, red peppers, tomatoes, and purple onions into equal parts, placing them on salad plates, then sprinkling them with garlic salt and crumbled feta. Once the bread was ready, I cut it into diagonal slices. After brushing them with a mixture of melted butter and olive oil, I sprinkled them with shredded mozzarella flakes and put them back in the oven to melt the cheese. Using the same butter base, I began roasting the lamb. After dinner, Tracy and I washed the dishes. It's always a compliment to the cook when there are no leftovers, and that was the case that night. It took us about an hour to say goodbye for the night. We've been busy all week. It turns out David's friend Peter was a food critic who wrote about his experience with me. It was published in the Sunday newspaper as an addition to his regular column. He emphasized that my focus on cooking is to provide good quality at reasonable prices for families living on a tight budget. I can be a snob sometimes, he said, and that night I was. I ordered French onion soup, which he and his girlfriend refused to eat after trying it. I was angry. In less than ten minutes he had prepared a new batch for the whole store. My portion was half the size of his, and the cost of preparation was three times higher. He did it in less than ten minutes. The balance was perfect. The caramelized onions showed through in every bite without overpowering the flavor of the beef broth. I have to admit, what he created was perfection. Then the hostess introduced him to me. I was amazed. We received so many requests for my French onion soup on Monday and Tuesday that it became our lunch special on Friday. French onion soup with fries for $6.99. There was a line to the door. Many visitors, after having lunch, ordered additional servings of soup to take away. Our usual post-lunch rush did not occur. At 10 o'clock on Friday night, as I was getting ready to leave, Tracy walked into the kitchen wearing jeans, a white blouse, and a men's denim shirt casually pulled on and unbuttoned. She walked right up to me and kissed me on the lips in front of everyone. We couldn't go dancing last Friday, so we're going to a country bar to catch the last set, Tracy said. I came by taxi so you could take me home. It's been five years since we danced. I was stiff, stiff and tired by the time the band finished playing. It was almost two in the morning when I took her home. I won't admit it to anyone, but the damn woman could still wear me down. I was not surprised when the waitress returned on Saturday afternoon with a special request. A little girl wanted her dad to make French onion soup with fries and brown gravy. I did. After that, she didn't leave until I gave her lots of butterfly kisses. David Barton took over and I moved into the corporate department. My former assistant became the new chef. The first thing we did was give the restaurant a new name. This is how Pastels appeared. This was ideal because the restaurant itself was a warm and inviting place designed to help you relax. Already in the first week, we established a franchise program. I headed the promotion department for all three networks. It was a shock for me, freeing up evenings and weekends, but it also gave Tracy and I the time we needed to learn how to be a couple. We tried to take Riley to my parents at least twice a month. It was nice to see them bond. 
one of David's smartest decisions was to invite all current franchise owners to join the corporation even more closely, giving them the opportunity to participate in building from the ground up using the same suppliers. They liked that it included blueprints for the new building. In the first three months, a third of them signed contracts. By doing this, he proved to me that he was committed to the long term. Our stock of broths was a huge success. Both the beef and chicken versions were richer in flavor than any others on the market, while costing half the wholesale price. The profit potential for the corporation was amazing. On the last trip to my parents' house, my mother gave me her grandmother's engagement ring. I gave it away for recycling. There was a time. That Saturday morning, Tracy's mother opened the door for me at seven in the morning and let me inside. Riley had a bowl of cereal for breakfast. She was always happy to see me. Tracy was still sleeping. Katie poured me a cup of coffee and sat with me at the kitchen table. Not every man can see me like this in the morning, said Katie. Are you going to tell me what you're up to? I laughed and replied, it will be a surprise. We kept up a light conversation until we heard Tracy wake up. Then I took the ring box out of my pocket and showed it to her. I'm going to propose when she least expects it. That's why I parked the truck by the road, I said with a smile. Good thing I stuck my cell phone in that old robe, Katie replied. And you're right, she'll be shocked to see you so early. We heard Tracy coming down the stairs. I moved and hid so she wouldn't see me when she came in. I put a finger to my lips, letting Riley know not to say anything. Tracy walked through the living room into the kitchen with a real bed hairdo and her eyes barely open. She took a cup from the cupboard to pour herself some coffee. After after she took the first sip, I spoke. Good morning, beautiful. I hope you made coffee for me too, I said. Tracy turned around in surprise. What are you doing here so early? We need to look at the furniture today. Sooner or later, we will have to do it. So I decided it would be better early, I answered, approaching her. Why? We don't have anything urgent to do, Tracy said, looking at me with confusion. No, not yet, I replied. But that may change. And what is that supposed to mean? She looked at me in confusion. Well, that depends on a couple of questions, I said as I prepared to take the ring out of my pocket. What questions? asked Tracy. At that moment, I got down on one knee and took out a box with a ring. Here's the question, Tracy Barton. Will you marry me? Tracy's eyes filled with tears as I placed the ring on her finger. I told my mom I was going to propose to you the last time we were there. She gave me her grandmother's engagement ring, which I had redesigned and added to. I also had a jeweler make an engagement ring to go with it, I explained. With tears in her eyes, Tracy replied, I haven't even said yes yet. Yes, you already said it, my love. Your facial expressions say it all, I replied, standing up. Smart guy, she replied before sharing a deep kiss with me. Her mother filmed it all. I think she cried more than her daughter. Little Riley looked worried. So I let go of Tracy, walked over to Riley and picked her up, taking her back to her mother. Riley, is it okay for me if your mom and dad get married? I asked. And we will become a real family. How's your friend Maddie? She asked. I nodded in response. The biggest smile appeared on her face. I thought we would spend the whole day shopping but we only went to one quality furniture store. It turns out Tracy was expecting this, but didn't know when. She's already chosen a new bedroom furniture set with a queen-size bed and six different accessories. I like the huge chest that would sit at the foot of the bed. Riley's bedroom set was chosen to serve hurry for many years. She had chosen two sets for the dining room and wanted my opinion. We chose a set with two captain's chairs and six chairs, along with a matching sideboard and buffet. We both decided that our main conversation would be choosing the size of the TV and the style of its stand in the family room. We settled on a 60-inch, two rocking chairs, a large corner sofa, and matching coffee and side tables. After we paid extra for same-day delivery, 
They promised to deliver everything to us before two o'clock in the afternoon. Like me, Tracy saw more value in quality than price. While I was in the produce section at our local Walmart, picking up some basic items that I was short on, Tracy made a run to the toy section to pick out some new stuffed animals for our daughter's new room. She found me waiting at the exit, sitting on the bench after the cash register. Her two carts were overflowing with towel sets, bedding, bath mats, and all those personal items a woman uses to make a home her own. We drove home to our future home after unpacking everything and throwing away things I had because they no longer matched her accents or color scheme. We moved the little furniture I had in the bedroom into a spare room just in case. In her opinion, she was not even suitable for charity. Luckily, our furniture arrived ahead of schedule. We had them unpack each piece so she could check for damage. By the time we had all the furniture packed and placed, she had already washed all the new bedding and made the beds. Our huge chest at the foot of the bed was filled with blankets and blankets for emergencies. Our double vanity in the master bedroom now had his and hers towels with a laundry basket. I took all the cardboard and packaging to the waste incinerator. Since we skipped dinner, I made a late snack. Nothing fancy, just a BLT club sandwich. As I was cleaning up and getting ready to take her home, she came out of the master bedroom wearing only one of my long t-shirts. We never made it back to her house that night. I have to admit that damn wife Shana proved that she was still that good. By the time she was done with me, I was exhausted and tired. It didn't take long for us both to quickly fall asleep. I woke up to the aroma of fresh coffee and the sound of many voices. I pulled on some clean briefs and jeans before heading out. It's a good thing I did because sitting in the living room with Tracy were her parents, my parents, my sister, and our daughter. I didn't realize it, but I overslept. Little Riley wanted to see her new home, said David Barton with a big laugh. And Tracy wanted us to bring her some clothes. We talked to your parents yesterday after I sent the video of you proposing to your mom, Katie said. Your mom and I decided that we should meet. When Tracy called me and asked me to bring some things, they were already on the way. I sent a message to your mom suggesting we meet here. Tracy came over and hugged me. So many secrets with our family. Without a doubt, I said, picking Riley up. Riley, do you like your new bedroom? She nodded. Can Patches and Peaches sleep with me? It will be up to them. When the cats are ready, they will come. But it may take a while. Has everyone had breakfast yet? I asked. Most were too excited to even think about it. I excused myself and went to finish getting dressed. Riley came with me. When we got back, I put two bags of bacon in cold water to defrost. Riley helped me make two dozen cookies from scratch. This was our first time using our new dining table. We all sat drinking coffee. The ladies were busy planning the wedding. One side of the family wanted a big celebration. The other wanted a more modest event. I whispered to Tracy that it might be easier for us to just run away. She smiled back winked and quietly replied, Does it matter to you how we do this? I told him I didn't care as long as we were legally married and that Riley felt like she was an important part of it. Okay, that's enough, said Tracy. We're going to have a small wedding. The best man, the bridesmaid, our daughter Twig, that's all. When we get back from our honeymoon, we'll have an old-fashioned dance in the barn, Tracy said. Mom and Dad Pearson, I think you did the same thing. With hay bales and everything, my father answered. Even the band was made up of locals who would sometimes get together for jam sessions. An equipment shed would be perfect, my mom said. Katie, we could decorate it together. Okay, let's make a deal, David said. As long as you let me pay for the bar. That's exactly what we did. We got married on my parents' wedding anniversary. Three months later, there were tears in everyone's eyes during the ceremony. Little Riley was given her ring. I put it on her after we said our vows. The barn party got a little upgrade by hiring a professional band. Mom had a full house that night as relatives, and we stayed overnight. 
Tracy and I lay in bed that night, resting after a night of dancing. I mentioned that my parents were very proud of how everything turned out. It felt like a confirmation of their decisions in life. Tracy looked me straight in the eye and gave me a big kiss. Just wait until tomorrow when we tell both of our parents that Riley is going to have a sibling. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.